Welcome everyone. We're ready to dive in to um, chapter one of Logiciel. Uh, I myself read it a couple of times uh, in this past week just to get a sense of the overall sort of take home message. And, and it's a little tricky, it kind of squeezed a lot of things in there. So I'm going to sort of step back and um, put some of the mathematical context um, a little bit more explicitly. Um, and so I'm going to ju I'll jump around and I won't actually quote that much from the book, but it's a lot of stuff that is talked about in the book and I have a few bits from the book. Uh, and as, as usual, just jump in if you want me to, or if you want to stop and talk about something or work through something. None of it is particularly obvious, uh, so happy to talk about anything completely you think it sounds like level zero. <laughs> and with that, we'll dive in. So yes, we're gonna talk about computation and the real, chapter one. So uh, I eventually, kept, as, as putting this together, I thought, okay, there's sort of a story here which he doesn't necessarily want to come out and say, which I think I will, uh, which caveat, uh, they don't necessarily want to say is that there's a sort of historical irony <laughs> in the history of mathematics that seeking certainty sort of produced the opposite. So the kind of plot that 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 uh, I'll sort of outline is that there's this ancient mathematical baggage that has been carried around, particularly with the Greeks and since then, is of two things: infinity and self-referential paradoxes. Um, and uh, dealing with them led to computation, eminently useful, um, uh, and an aware uh, uh, sort of, uh, so in some cases people were disappointed, but it was an awareness of the limits of um, of reason or sort of, or a certain type of reason that is very certain. And uh, in my mind, this, this often reminds me of alchemy, which sort of as a side effect produced all this useful stuff, chemistry and dyes and colors and stuff like that, but it didn't really get what it wanted, which was um, <laughs> in, in eternal life and uh, philosopher's stone. So uh, right in, on the first page, uh, uh, Kavya talks about um, an example, which I don't think is an ideal example, but I'll just go through it because he, he starts there. Um, he talks about Euclid's um, five postulates for geometry. Um, and even if we didn't learn it in that way, most of a lot of us in school kind of do proofs that loosely are based on Euclid's way of thinking. So there's a straight line, maybe drawn from any given point to any other. Um, a straight line may be extended to any finite length. A circle may be described with any given point as a center and any distance as its radius. Um, all right angles are congruent. And here comes number five big the problem. If a straight line intersects two other straight lines and so makes two interior angles on one side of it together less than two right angles, then the other straight lines will meet at a point if extended far enough on the side on which the angles are less than two right angles. Um, it's also called the parallel postulate um, because you can also read it as when the two angles are 90 degrees, then um, the two lines meet nowhere or at infinity. Um, and right from the get-go, and possibly even with Euclid himself, he didn't like this parallel postulate. They were like, well, it's so much longer than the other four and doesn't seem as self-evidently obvious. Um, and can we maybe uh, try to prove the fifth one from the other four? And, and this was going on all the way up until 1700s or 1800s. And then eventually people realized that you couldn't do it. And in fact, um, in the, by the 19th century, people realized that you could have you know, other ways that you can construct geometry which do not produce any kind of uh, logical contradictions. And that's how you get hyperbolic and elliptical geometry. Um, so you can, so, you, so all the time that uh, they were working on this, they, it was sort of something that didn't get resolved into a definitive answer. And then the answer they got was kind of, well, it depends on what space you're in which is a form of contingency. And this word contingency keeps on coming up. Um, and that's like uh, sort of an illustrative example. I don't think it's an ideal example, but it's not bad. Um, so I think in order to, to really kind of place what's happening here, uh, it's, it'll be good to like look at the history of, of ideas about infinity. 
um, uh, and, and sort of trace that up until the 19th century when things start to uh, really explode. So um, there was both a kind of fascination and discomfort with infinity uh, that has been a real driving force uh, in philosophical and mathematical thinking. Um, and so one of the earliest mentions uh, in, in the Greek pre-Socratic world um, was an Aximander who was sort of on the in the pro-infinity camp, the, the, definitely two camps all the way to the present day. Um, he had this word, uh, aperon, which means uh, unbounded or indefinite. And he thought that that was the origin of all things. So it's sort of mixed in with a kind of creation story. Um, and then you have the famous uh, Zeno uh, of Elea, who had um, a set of famous paradoxes that involve infinity, uh, movement, and time. And you've probably heard of you know, Achilles and the tortoise. You know, if, a, if the tortoise has a head start uh, and, Ach and Achilles is much faster than the tortoise, then can Achilles ever overtake the tortoise? Well, you could say that however fast Achilles runs, that uh, he takes a finite amount of time to reach where the tortoise was. And in that finite amount of time, the tortoise has already moved a little bit. So most people say that calculus sort of deals with that. But if you, I highly recommend looking at the other uh, uh, three or four paradoxes that, that he came up with, because they're not actually that easy to resolve. Uh, and sort of just saying calculus solves it is not exactly um, satisfactory. And even Bertrand Russell, all the way in, the, in uh, not too long ago, was a great fan of these paradoxes and said they were, you know, of great subtlety. And I think the general consensus is that um, at, at, they haven't been adequately sort of dispensed with, even to this day. And all of them, uh, or most of them involve either infinity, infinitesimals, or some sort of weirdness regarding how we construe time. Um, so Aristotle uh, is one of the main sources for these paradoxes because he wanted to get rid of them <laughs> and, and sort of dispense with them. And he came up with, with a solution, which was the solution until fairly recently, that uh, there's no actual infinities, um, uh, that there's only potential infinities. So, so if you think that a line is composed of infinitely many points, Aristotle would say, no, 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 that's nonsense. It isn't composed of infinitely many anything. It's, you just have the potential to subdivide it if you so cho choose. And um, that was kind of the state of play for a long time um, until scientific revolution. And suddenly calculus kind of makes things uh, much more complicated for this distinction between actual uh, and potential. So, um, <clears throat> so when calculus was invented by Newton and Leibniz, um, suddenly now there's a way of kind of asking again, are there actual infinities? Um, and uh, so initially, uh, particularly the infinitesimals was a, were, were a big problem because that was the way that Newton and uh, Leibniz presented calculus. So for instance, when you're trying to, when you're taught as a, as a sort of school kid, um, what a derivative is, you're often shown something like a tangent to a curve like in this diagram, and then you, you draw this triangle with some delta x on the x-axis and a delta y on the y-axis. And then you say, well, the tangent is constructed by saying that each of the, the delta x gets smaller and smaller and smaller. And you sort of do this and so on thing. And you say um, that it's an infinitesimal quantity. And you can say, well, doesn't that seem to imply that we're eventually dividing by zero? And this was a big source of irritation. And uh, Bishop Barclay uh, wrote uh, a stinging critique of, of this sort of thing. And he said that these infinitesimals were the, the ghosts of departed quantities. And uh, even though he wasn't a mathematician, a lot of mathematicians felt the pressure to make these things sound more reasonable. And so the way that they did that uh, was initially um, with Cauchy sequences, which some of you might have learned about. Um, um, at the turn of the 19th, 18th century. And then in the 19th century, you had like Bolzano and uh, uh, Weierstrass talking about the epsilon delta and stuff like that. So they had the concept of limits. So if you're taking calculus in college, you, uh, you replace this intuitive way of thinking about derivatives with this other thing, which seems really weird, which is that, um, that for a certain epsilon value, you can always get closer and closer. And in order to do uh, that, Johan, can I ask a quick question? Yes, yes. 
So I don't know. Is this limits? Is it related to the concept of uh, what Aristotle was talking about, like potential and actual? Like when and you say a tends to zero, a is never zero. It's right. is it something to do with that with that concept? I mean, I think that's a fair way to put it. So. So when you look at the actual epsilon delta way of framing uh, um, these limits, the or, or you um, you're always dealing with finite quantities, but you can all if it, you say that well for any sort of error tolerance you pick, I can pick pick find another number that makes it fit in that. And that's how you talk about convergence of a, of a sequence, for instance. So so they kind of got rid of the idea that an infinitesimal is simultaneously finite and zero when you want it to be, <laughs> like right at the end of the derivation. Um, so in order to, so the limits concept came before set theory uh, and then sort of cleaning it up further, um, can, uh, Delikin first and then Cantor kind of put all that in this thing called set theory, which um, struck people as much more logical. Um, and, but <laughs> it's like the, a solution to this, you know, couple hundred year old controversy led to a whole new set of controversies. Uh, because now suddenly uh, the sets concept uh, allowed for actual infinities uh, and new and, and paradoxes, new paradoxes that reminded people of the old paradoxes. Um, um, so, so by the late 19th century, people were very interested in mathematical foundations. Um, and so those were sought in logic. So Gottlob Frege is the real sort of uh, driver of this, and Charles Sanders Peirce also. Older Peirce was not that well known at the time he was doing things. They were quite in parallel to Frege. So a lot of what happened was in response to Frege, um, uh, and and we'll see a little bit about the consequences of trying to frame things in terms of logic. So this is back and forth in the history of math and logic about whether math is a subset of logic or the opposite. And to this day, you have kind of both perspectives. Um, so it's, in, it's interesting that there's still this <laughs> unresolved kind of question. Uh, so um, we can kind of think about this more in terms of, well, what are the issues here? What are we talking about? Um, so when you're thinking about numbers, there's natural, and particularly nowadays in, with a lot of interest in discrete physics or digital physics to say, uh, this continuum, which we'll talk about more, doesn't exist. And that so Leopold Kronecker is one of the founders of constructivism. He didn't like all this infinitesimals and infinity business. And he said that God created the integers and all else is the work of man. So he was not having all this stuff that Cantor was introducing into um, mathematics. Um, and there's an intuition here uh, that counting is natural and there's nothing particularly human subjective about it, at least at first glance, uh, as you know, people with you know, psych and neural backgrounds, you can come up with various ways that counting is not as straightforward uh, as people would think initially. Uh, but that was uh, Kronecker's way of thinking, and it's still quite common. Um, and then from there, uh, a, a kind of next step, not necessarily historically, but in terms of how people construct their, their, their understanding, um, you have ratios uh, between integers. So, uh, and from there you get fractions. So you have all the rational numbers. Um, but, uh, so, so you might want to say that, um, well, another fairly practical and real world application other than counting is geometry. Uh, there's nothing sort of uh, mystical about it necessarily. <laughs> it's all very real world. So you might ask, can we just use integers and rational numbers to do all of geometry? And as you all know, the answer is no. Uh, even the ancient Greeks knew that the square root of two is uh, irrational. There are lots of proofs of this, and because if you're curious about, uh, you know, excluded middle and stuff like that, you can see the proofs. There are several on Wikipedia, and the most easy proof that often people learn in school or, or shortly after uh, is a proof by contradiction. So you start by assuming that it is rational, and then you derive a contradiction from that. But there is a constructive proof. Uh, we, we'll talk about constructivism. Uh, right. So, so, so there's a lot of there's there's kind of an ancient tension between like just pure numbers and uh, in integers, the count the, uh, um, the counting numbers, natural numbers, and um, and uh, the the numbers you get from measurement from geometry. 
Um, so the, um, the concept of the continuum kind of comes in maybe more from geometry than counting, which is that there's always seems to be more space between any two points. And when you actually look at these numbers like square root of two, they're not some magical other number. They do kind of sit between uh, the integers and the natural numbers and the rationals that, that, that we've already constructed. So they do seem to actually occupy the same conceptual space. And over, over the 19th century, people found a way of kind of populating this in a way using set theory. So um, you start with the naturals, then you have the integers, the, which is the negative numbers at zero and, and the counting numbers. And Q represents the, the quotient numbers, the, the rationals. And then you get the, the reals, which include um, irrational numbers um, as well as transcendental numbers. So some of the irrational numbers are known as algebraic numbers because they're the solutions to um, algebraic equations. So, so this is the so so there are ways of constructing this uh, over the course of the 19th century, and um, but it's an ancient um, controversy because it, if you take seriously uh, some of these ideas, then there's an actual infinity between just zero and one, for instance. It's not a potential infinity because of the way they've been constructed, in a sense. So, um, so Cantor really um, sort of opened Pandora's box here for returning to the concept of actual infinity. And he kind of connected it to religion also. Um, but, and he really felt as though he was simultaneously doing a kind of theological thing. But, um, uh, but yeah, so they, um, this change, and this is from the Wikipedia page, um, was initiated by Bolzano and Cantor. Um, so via set theory, and Cantor had these different realms of the infinite, the infinity of God, the infinity of reality, and the transfinite numbers and sets of mathematics. He invented this term transfinite to deal with different types of infinity. Um, so around this time, mathematicians once again were worried that they were assuming the existence of a continuum without any proof. Um, they were just sort of taking it for granted. Um, and and so this zoo of, of weird infinities, um, that people of Hilbert call it Cantor's paradise. So I was going to give a flavor of what that's like in case you've never seen this. Um, so um, Cantor, arguably, you could say, was the was one of the first to highlight an operation that could even be simpler than counting. Um, um, so he used this this idea um, to to sort of tame infinity and talk about comparisons, the sizes of different infinities. And it's just um, isomorphism. It's just making one-to-one -one maps between, between things. So the proof, for instance, that um, the natural numbers have the same size as the even numbers or the odd numbers um, or the rationals all involve just making this one-to-one -one map. Um, and and so, for the- yeah. Johan, um, <clears throat> if you don't mind me interrupting here. Go for it. Yeah. Um, what is, I don't know, what, what's your, I, I don't know, I, I, I don't know what I think about this either, like, in terms of primitives, like, <laughs> like whether counting or correspondence is actually like more, uh, more primitive in, in any sort of way, like psychologically speaking, I suppose. I think, fantastic question. I don't have a horse in this race. I find both, <laughs> I, I, I find both kind of equally mysterious in a way. Uh, because, like, um, well, so we, we are okay at classification, right? I mean, we have decent models of object recognition, and from but we don't necessarily have widely accepted models of counting <laughs> in like neural models. Mm -hmm. Um, they seem to rely on classification, right? Because you only count things that are in some sense the same, they have to be in some sense the same and different in order to say. Bump, right, but, but we're able to, but we're, we are able to, well, I, and I don't know whether this is earlier or later, like, um, able to tell whether things are, whether there's like, you know, more or fewer of things. Um, I mean, especially like at the level of like, uh, up to, of like the subitization level, like the, like, you know, handfuls of things, two to yeah, three, yeah. or like around there, like. Um, I mean, 
like but it's are, hard to call that but it's hard to call that counting right so i agree like, yeah i mean it's not and, and you could like there are tribes right that don't have numbers greater than two or three so they don't really count um whether they make correspondences is, is not is less clear um this like they're, an they're, also, they're also i think a difference between like you said like looking at two things and saying that they are the same size for example perceptually and there's a difference between that and very fine that two things are the same size right like usually um and I, I think the primitive question can be asked need to be asked separately for those two cases right so um so let's say we can perceptually quickly verify up to six counts for example whether two things are of the same size right and after that we start messing up I think that's a different um, um, thing than us being able to verify natural numbers and integers of the same size. Oh yeah, sure. I mean, even and even like anything that is like a like you know relatively like continuous size thing, like you know, being able to yeah. like that. right, and that's good because it brings everything back to this this emphasis shifting in this book and in mathematics in general between like having mathematical methods and this notion of proof or verification. I guess something like, like one thing that I, I think I forgot to put in here is like computation has probably been around for a while. I was talking to him about this, like the act, things that are like algorithms probably precede recorded history. So what we're really talking about is like the, 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 the short history of like how we got to the theory of computation. It's, it's, and what I like about the story is how roundabout it is in the sense that at, at this point, you might be wondering like, what does any of this have to do with computation? But we get there fairly soon. Yeah? Um, so, but yeah, that's a tough question. And, and I think there's so much fun anthropology <laughs> that one needs to do. Um, that, that Lakoff and Johnson book, Where Mathematics Comes From, is also relevant. I read it very long ago. I should probably read it again. But I think that this is probably a question that can be asked developmentally if it's done like cleverly enough. Yeah, and, and like there are these like little children who like to line things up, right? Sometimes you see yeah. it more with autistic children, but but um, but yeah, it, it and correspondence. Yeah, I want, I, it's worth looking into. Yeah, yeah. Like you can even like maybe hypothetically think that this is is actually not one or the other, but both like layered one one over the other. I in a series of counted correspondences that are then uh, further counted. Yeah, because think of what we do when we use our fingers, right? Like I still use my fingers to count, like like like. like I'm, and I'm establishing a correspondence between something and my fingers. Yeah. I, I was going to touch on that in the language thing, just to side. I, I believe I could check it, but I believe there are cultures that that can count but don't use numbers. Mm -hmm. So, you know, yeah. Yeah, I was going to say okay. that in terms in terms of like understanding more cognitively what the difference I guess between is the world one-to-one -one correspondence and continuum it's like you, you still have a really good grasp on whether something is darker or lighter of a certain shade and that really is uncountable right there's no color for it like uh there's no numbers like we don't work like that technically um but anyone can do it anyone you know can be tricked as well if you don't have if you don't have a way to count them then you can be tricked because you're only comparing right but but I think that but I think that like like in in as like um like with like very small children my my guess is I don't know this for certain um, that they would be able to distinguish like two objects versus three objects um, I mean like or maybe not even have like the the linguistic capability to to distinguish like a darker shade and a lighter shade. There's okay. some psychophysics related to this in monkeys and all, and I think in infant in small children. Uh, I don't remember how good the data was, but I can look into that also. Yeah, because because you can do the controls where you could have um, like two images that that actually have the same like area or same luminance or same like solid angle or, uh, or something like that, and how they and they only differ by the number by, by changing the like size. And you can do like match the following things like that. So yeah, that's a tough one. <laughs> but yeah, I, I, I tend towards maybe they're kind of intertwined. Yeah. Um, so this method, like what, what's cool uh, about a lot of things that happen in math is that very old 
sort of recipes just get used at sort of higher and higher levels. So for instance, this is the kind of thing that um, I think Bolzano noticed this um, uh, before Cantor, but it became more widely known with Cantor that you can take, so with, with traditional objects, right? A part of something is always smaller than the thing, but you could imagine like taking a line and sort of breaking off a piece and curving it into a half circle and just drawing lines like this, right? So what you notice is that every single point on, on the real line has a corresponding point on the circle. So, and you know, you can write that down in, 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 in various ways. And so it seems as though this unbounded infinity can be mapped onto something that seems objectively smaller. So these are the kinds of quirky things that, that people started to um, uh, notice with um, the way of Cantor's way of looking at things, uh, because you can make it quite rigorous. In fact, uh, many of you have probably heard of the um, Banach-Tarski paradox, and that relates in a way to the quirks of, of set theory. Um, the, um, it's not too far of a jump actually between what, what's happening here in this bottom thing and up there, but that you can have a look at it. But yeah, there are all kinds of weird things that start to emerge from Cantor's paradise and people like it, like it because you know you can share these proofs. It's not like they're just whims or fancies. People can agree on these things. Yeah, also as a tangent, uh, side tangent, all of this arises only if you start thinking of lines as collection of points. Yes, so. yes. And, and that was useful for certain things, but you don't have to do it. And the nice thing about the second half of the 20th century is how many new ways of thinking about things have started to accumulate. But uh, but but set theory being a foundation, there was a lot of reasons for it. Right? The, 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 it made a lot of things easier in many fields of math, but maybe not all. Um, so, so there was this quest for certainty, completeness, and sense because things stopped making sense at some point in, in the late 19th century. Um, and people started to ask, well, uh, how far can we go with, with all this? Um, so there were three major philosophies that emerged at the turn of the 20th century, logicism, formalism, intuitionism. And this book is definitely in favor of a version of intuitionism, which in turn, which itself is a version of constructivism. And so both, Logicism and formalism, we'll talk a little more on that, will relied on set theory. Um, but Bertrand Russell um, found that it allowed for a paradox, which is uh, Russell's paradox, which is um, does the set of all sets uh, that don't contain themselves can contain itself, uh, something like that. Uh, so it's a self-referential paradox. Um, and people often talk about it with that the barber who shaves everyone who does not shave themselves, does the barber shave himself? It's an unresolvable paradox. And um, so there were problems with uh, straight up logicism. Um, uh, although there's like attempts to revive it. Um, so I found this blog post that has it nice. Sometimes it's hard to get all three comparisons in the same like short amount of text, but. So logicism um, is, the, is the idea that foundations can be achieved by logical elements like formation rules or grammatical rules and some philosophical notions, basically relying on the idea that math is a subset of logic. Um, formalism um, often uh, is, associated, is, is the idea that there are these formal elements that can ground mathematics, but not necessarily logical, meaning that it's sort of like the arbitrary rules of the game. You pick some rules uh, and, and then and you can kind of go with them and then you build in the logic if you need to. And there's a certain element of, of like uh, shut up and calculate um, here um, in formalism, but not, not it's maybe, um, and also uh, if you talk to people, both mathematicians and maybe not so much mathematicians, but a lot of people outside of mathematics, that's how they often think of mathematics as like abstract symbols moving around. Um, and um, so that's um, a common perspective and quite popular. Uh, and then there's intuitionism, which is sort of the, the obscure one, um, that there's non-formal intuitive subjects um, um, are fundamental. And so then they're not rejecting philosophical questions. So it's, it's a debate about like, what is the subject matter um, of uh, mathematics? And also what are the appropriate methods for communicating truths 
uh, or establishing truths in, in mathematics. So logicism is the oldest of these, not very popular at the moment, but it's still around in some form or the other. Um, so the strong version maintains that all mathematical tr truths in some branch form a species of logical truth. Uh, a weaker version specifically about theorems and basically proofs. So, um, so there were two kind of waves of this, Weger's own wave and Russell's. Um, and then there was a big decline because of uh, Gödel's incompleteness theorem. Um, and also the ascendancy of a different way of thinking, um, Zermelo Frankel set theory, ZF. Um, and Russell's theory of types, uh, which he was working on, they came up with some problems in the Principia Mathematica, which he was working on with Whitehead. Um, the theory of types will come up again in, in uh, many times in this book. So obviously this was something that was dusted off and restored in a way fairly soon after this. With um, So yeah, now there's the neo kind of version. Um, and then you have formalism. So uh, this paper uh, by Hilbert on the infinite, I just found it and it's quite, quite worth reading. Um, uh, so here's some good quotes. So he's very acerbic. He's like, a careful reader will find the literature of mathematics is cluttered with inanities and absurdities, which have had their source in the infinite. Um, so he uh, is very um, aware of that. And there's, so he his suggestion for avoiding paradoxes and, and silly statements um, is to um, strengthen um, and nurse what we have. And then and there's this famous line, which is where the term Cantor's paradise that comes from. No one shall drive us out of the paradise which Cantor has created for us. So he obviously liked a lot of the weirdness of Cantor's world. Um, and so, um, but he's interested in certitude. So we must establish through mathematics, same certitude for our deductions um, as exists in ordinary elementary number theory, which no one doubts and where contradiction and paradoxes arise only through our own carelessness. So this is a very clear kind of statement of what he thinks the ideal mathematics is. Um, there are no paradoxes, basically. So, um, but here's where, like, when you're reading the paper, sometimes uh, it, you, I, I, find, I found this to be quite a turn, because he clearly thinks that there's some subject matter of mathematics, but it seems strange to say that the subject matter is the concrete symbols themselves whose structure is immediately clear and recognizable. But I guess it's like you work so long with the, the symbols that represent something else that, that that becomes the subject matter in a sense. Um, so, so there's another point here which he makes which is quite interesting, not really the theme of this book, but, but it comes up in various ways. But to preserve the simple formal rules of ordinary Aristotelian logic, which is what people kind of were really clinging to, we must supplement finitary stat statements with ideal statements. So it's like, and this was a, a sort of move that people knew was, was useful in mathematics ever since uh, imaginary numbers were added. So there's this idea that you can supplement something that, that is sort of intuitively has, makes no sense. Like, like when we talk about square root of minus one, we just sort of accept it and go with it uh, for the most part and, and don't really have a picture of what that means, unlike the square root of any other number. So he, he kind of says, well, let's just sort of say that there's something we need to kind of pack, fill in the, the, the theory. Um, so, so he generalizes this to say, there's two kinds of formulas, uh, the meaningful ones and the formulas which signify nothing and which are the ideal structures of our theory. Um, I like how upfront he is about that. It's like, well, there's all these meaningless statements, but the theory needs them in order to preserve logical coherence. So that's formulas. Um, now, um, Brouwer didn't really like any of that and had big feud with uh, David Hilbert about this. Um, and so this definitely, um, Kavya's book talks about these two acts of intuitionism, which are a little bit strange and obscure, but I think I found some material to help with it. So his first, so his basic idea is that mathematics is not about something in a pl platonic realm where something already exists, but it's in our own minds but also in a sort of idealized mathematician's mind. So he wants to separate like exact opposite of what the formalist wants to do, completely separate mathematics from mathematical language and hence the phenomena of language. 
Um, and I recognize that intuitionistic mathematics is an essentially languageless activity of the mind. And this next part is, is often quoted and kind of mysterious when you first look at it. This activity is having its origin in the perception of a move of time. This perception of a move of time may be described as the falling apart of a life moment into two distinct things, out of which one of which um, give way to the other, but is retained in memory. If the tuity thus born is divested of all quality, it passes into the empty form of the common substratum of all tuities. And it is this common substratum, this empty form, which is the basic intuition in mathematics. So yeah, this is quite strange, but I have in the next slide, something that kind of makes it a little bit more palatable and even kind of relates to some neuro kind of ideas. The second act of intuitionism is again, kind of hard to get wrap one's head around and I still haven't fully understood it, but uh, it talks about ways of creating mathematical entities. There's relatively more or less freely proceeding infinite sequences of mathematical entities previously acquired. Um, um, and, uh, in this, and also mathematical species. So there are properties previously acquired. So you're kind of able to grow things either using a law or essentially randomly um, or by your own free choice. So it's all about that sort of freedom and contingency in the math. So this act, it comes up again in the book, but this first act uh, is worth maybe pausing on a sec. It's like, what is this tuity business? So I found a pretty book, um, sorry, paper on this uh, by, by the, um, Van Atten et al. Um, and um, basically talking about, like, imagine that in your mind, you, you have, you're experiencing things like one after the other, uh, like things instead of, so let's say, appearing and disappearing. Um, and you're retaining them in memory. So you're kind of writing down in brackets the kind of things that have passed into memory. So if something is in the present, then there's something else in the past. And that's what these represent. Wait, so is um, this the same as a binary tree or is this different? So there is some relation to trees that I haven't fully worked out yet. Um, but basically it, this idea is that when I experience something now and then it fades away, it's still present in memory. And the combination of what's present in memory and what's here now uh, is what gives me the ability to make a unified whole. So these earlier stages of what I experienced are, are gone, but they're retained in some sense. And, but they, they're, they leave their traces. But this must be the case, or it might be possible to take in the construction as a unified whole. So they have this diagram of like, basically kind of what's happening now and like the, the traces of what happened before. And what I realized is this is a lot like how we, are, we model like eligibility traces in, in neuroscience, right? something happens or even neuron fires and the consequences of it kind of linger. So you can think of each of these as like, so this is like time here and the present here. So if you look at each of these points is like something lingering from the past and my ability to kind of form a representation of a sequence, which is sort of true in, in many ways of like Grossberg's way of modeling it is uh, that what's, what was a sequence has been turned into a uh, simultaneous structure. So his idea is that the simultaneous structure maintains both unity and diversity, which is an interesting sort of initially sort of paradoxical uh, sounding is, idea. Is there any you can think of counting as an exercise in this form? Right. Uh, yeah, sort of, I guess. Um, I think so. Is well, counting in that? Yeah, like counting, like because to be able to count, it's it's a movement from the current count to the next count, um, yeah. and as you're counting, it has this property of like, a it's a movement in time. The previous count vanishes, um, yet the unity of all the numbers is maintained. Right, the previous um, thing vanishes, and you can. I was thinking about even how this is true, even of things that haven't vanished, but like if you incorporate attention, like if I'm trying to count various objects on my desk, right? I typically, okay, leaving aside sub subitizing, let's say I'm going one by one. Uh, I sort of do the object recognition and pick one and then I'm, I add something to an integrator and that's what is left in memory. Um, so it's something like that, but potentially also like when you hear a bunch of words in a sentence, 
And then the last word, like in one of those garden path sentences, right? Um, only the last word kind of helps you understand the whole sentence. That shows that everything else is sort of lingering in memory so that you get a unified sense of the meaning of the sentence while at the same time being able to maintain the separate uh, existences of each word in the sentence. That That's sort of what I think is going on here. Himanshu, uh, for, for the counting thing, can we think of it like this, given what, what has been said in that blue statement? Uh, mm -hmm. The successor functions are basically the memory uh, retention of the previous numbers in an appropriately modified manner, right? So you can just say that the successor in counting and that add addition of like new numbers, you could say that that is basically what's happening. The appropriately modified manner is the successor function that has been created in our memory. Yeah. And and if you want to stretch it even more, you can even like give give it a Hegelian twist, right? And think of this as the mediated uh, form yeah. of of what was presented earlier. That's good. That's, that's very good. But yeah, and for, for our purposes in, in neuroscience, we often use an exponential decay, right? So if I have items coming into working memory, boop, 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 what I have at the end, I can actually read off the order of, of what came from the magnitudes in the present. So the strongest thing is the most recent and so on. So I can create a primacy gradient, for instance. So um, I was going to say, I kind of did, I had a hard time when I first saw the word tuity and trying to come up with what was meant. But I think here it's a lot more clear. I was thinking it was something to do with like a, since it came up in the conversation of intuition, I was thinking maybe intuition in the cognitive sense, like correlation. So if we have it quickly, one thing succeeds the other, we tend to be able to create more of a correlation between it versus this thing that has sunk back in time, right? It doesn't mean that there isn't a correlation. It's just not yeah. intuitive. intuitive. It, I 100%. In fact, you could say that the correlation, um, like one version of the correlation is that successor function. And the and another is um, like, like um, if I wanted to build it like a, like a, some sort of um, synaptic weight learning system, I would need uh, the two traces to be present simultaneously in order to compute the correlation or you know to accumulate something that that serves as a correlation between something that's no longer present and something that is. So that's very neatly kind of fits to this. So the other thing he's trying to say is that mathematics abstracts away all quality, um, which is to say color, shape, um, uh, form, sound, smell are all gone away. So, 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 so what you're left with when you throw away all that stuff is mathematics. It's definitely not a majority position, but um, uh, it's uh, how he got to where he got. And it, it's not crucial to this book, but it's, I thought it would be nice to just clarify what it means. Yeah. So, so I'm, I'm um, still not, I'm not, I'm, I'm, I'm not convinced that this is not identical to a binary tree. Like, I think it might be. So there's this whole stuff about um, spreads and fans and things in, in browser choice sequences. Which I think, the, I haven't... I think if the additional part does not cap. So binary tree on its own is just a spatial description, right? It doesn't have this component of like uh, movement in time that he talks uh, about. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, that's that that's fine. But it's like a in that case, like a, a a growing binary tree or something like that. Then yeah, yeah, yeah. So this growth thing is is one of his big kind of ideas. That um, um yeah. But so. like when like um, I get the intuition that binary tree wouldn't quite work because uh, if you're up like like let's say that you have a binary tree with like uh, four leaves, and you're trying to figure out like what the next uh, like the the next item is, it's not unambiguous which leaf is going to be the one that's the next one whereas with the successor function it's always unambiguous so i think like what i'm reading into this is that it's more like a successor function than something like a binary tree where it's like uh it could be anything like the next item could be in any one of the two like uh, possible branches yeah the um, order is not really preserved in the, in a flat like where the all the nodes have the same sort of yeah or something like that i see so it's like a i mean it's just like a like a sequence but with like branches at every point or like just like uh, yeah meaning like if you draw this out right like yeah yeah you, you that's what you'll get but you you kind of want there to be like uh, some difference in weighting between 
the the each of them basically. Uh, but yeah, I, I don't think it's a bad intuition. But um, yeah, you, the type you, part, you, have you, to get you can think of as a tree, but in the reverse direction, it's deterministic. So yeah, okay. Um, so also, also with the binary tree, you don't have that modification in that suitable manner that they are speaking of, right? It's right, just right, the right. thing itself. There is nothing that has been modified necessarily. You're just putting it there. It has no. not been condensed or modified like Samir was saying with the successor function where there is this compression for lack of a better word that you don't have here. Yeah, what the modification is, I would assume is quite, it varies, right? Like it doesn't have to just be successor function because okay, that's true for counting. Maybe oh, that's just an example for counting. Yeah. But yeah, the, the, the tree part, like when we, if we ever come down to choice sequences, which I would like to understand better, this tree thing will come up, but I don't know how that fits in with the time story. So we'll have to, we should bookmark that. So, so all of, a lot, a lot, this sort of, a lot of this stuff, the developments in the 19th century kind of culminate in the Entscheidungs problem. I think I'm pronouncing that right. Um, which is just means the decision problem, um, which is a challenge um, posed by David Hilbert and Wilhelm Ackerman in 1928, which is, um, can we have an algorithm that considers um, as input a statement and asks and answers yes or no, uh, according to whether the statement is universally valid, which is to say valid in every structure satisfying those axioms. So we're starting to get to things that sound much more like computer science than math already. Um, uh, so you could say the theoretical computer science was born from attempts to answer this question. It's like, can we do this? Um, and all the answers were no. <laughs> that that came up um, in in uh, so we looked at how that happened. So the, the way I like to say it is that you know what they've shown Church, Turing, and Girdle is that you can't always look before you leap. You kind of have to sometimes run the program and just see what it does. So um, because at, by the when this was stated, algorithm wasn't even formalized. That was part of the work of of Alonzo Church initially and. Turing, who was his student. So um, his approach was something called effective calculability and lambda calculus. It's a little bit complicated to get into, and I don't fully understand it myself, but, and uh, Alan Turing's uh, concept the very next year um, of Turing machines, which are intuitively easier. Um, I've looked at the paper, it's, it's pretty readable, but I haven't worked through all the proofs. Um, so um, Turing himself uh, recognized that these are equivalent models of computation. One of Kavya's points is that this equivalence is not um, uh, like at the connotation level or, the, or there's useful differences between the different models that he wants to draw. Out. And he kind of leans, he prefers Church's approach to Turing's. Um, so, um, so, um, so Church's uh, um, ver uh, kind of uh, no answer uh, was it took the form that there is no computable function which decides whether two lambda calculus expressions are equivalent. Um, Turing's is the famous halting problem. There's no problem that will compute whether an arbitrary pro program will halt, will simply stop running. And, and he pr proved that his, um, the, like the kinds of programs that, his, that uh, he's talking about cover the same space as the, the computable functions um, that Church is talking about. And they were both influenced by uh, Gödel's incompleteness theorems, which were just a few years before that. We'll talk briefly about that. So this, you know, the celebrated theorem, there were two of them. Uh, one is that no consistent system of axioms whose theorems can be listed by an effective procedure, which he again defined slightly differently with an encoding involving. So what he did was sort of encode logic into mathematics rather than the other way around, um, as capable of pro proving all truths about the arithmetic of natural numbers. For any statement, uh, any such consistent formal system, there will always be statements about natural numbers that are true but unprovable within the system. And the second incompleteness system, uh, a theorem showed that the system can't even demonstrate its own consistency. So this was the kind of bomb dropped on uh, um, the, the, this, this field, particularly logicism. Uh, and uh, it's still kind of, people have often overstated like the meaning of all this. I don't think it has particular implications for physical reality, but within that world of math, I think it uh, was, was quite something. Um, and then there are other kind of related theorems that came up, one of which I only found out about recently, which is Tarski's undefinability theorem, uh, which is also quite interesting uh, and from the same period. 
that um, theorem state, um, so arithmetical truth cannot be defined in arithmetic. Uh, and another way of saying it is that no sufficiently rich interpreted language can represent its own semantics. Um, and uh, so basically you always need a meta theory to establish truth in a particular formal theory. And the latest kind of version of this that you see is something called homotopy type theory, which involves kind of a tower of Babel, an infinite stack of meta, meta um, theories for what constitutes equivalence, basically. So you have equivalences and equivalences between equivalences and so on and so on to infinity. Um, so what all this amounts to, um, the kind of lesson here, is that there's this kind of computational contingency. And what I find interesting about this is that I think a lot of people, including me a few years ago, would have said that computation has primarily the connotation of um, something deterministic and fixed and reliable. But the kind of great historical irony is that uh, like even in the moment of Turing's sort of unleashing of the concept of computation on the world, he's saying that, well, there are some things for which you can't get, so you, you can't have a certain type of certainty. You just have to kind of run the program. So, um, so Kavya in, in, in the introduction, he talks about this um, cleaving of mind from reason. And so there's this kind of historical rupture he talks about. So this is how I kind of gloss that. We, we've, we've entered the era um, when contingency enters into theory and not just practice. So earlier, it was obvious that for, for practical purposes, there's going to be all kinds of contingency, your computing device might break down, vacuum tubes might blow up, whatever, you know, analytical engine of Charles Babbage might have a issue. So that was always understood, and but that was never in the domain of pure mathematics. So there was this confidence that logic was perfect and didn't need any correction. And now we have this new thing within theory. Um, so, um, so this is why Kavya uh, says that computation is a model of contingency, which initially sounds like nonsense, <laughs> but I think that's what what he what what they mean. Um, so, you could say that these different kind of limits on 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 uh, certainty, und undecidability, uncomputability, undefinability, they could weaken the appeal of. Of Platonism uh, as well as formalism, but they haven't really, and they definitely didn't at the time when Brouwer was trying to promote his his approach. He was kind of in a backwater, and his he was he was a very famous topologist, so his his, his sort of he did a lot of classical math, but his philosophy of mathematics was not particularly popular. But it, now it is because computer science cares a lot more about actual constructive proofs. So they might not be interested in intuity or you know the intuitions, but they are interested in construction. So a lot of people are revisiting um, intuitionism because of that in the last few decades. So, um, and, and this is kind of where uh, Kavya once takes this chapter um, that um, he's, there's those two commitments or the two acts led to a major break uh, with the existing consensus. So there's Hilbert's program of formalism, uh, which sort of replaced logicism uh, as the dominant um, school of mathematics. And Brouwer was, was saying that uh, he didn't want anything to do with that. So the question of where mathematical exactness does exist is answered differently by the two sides. The intuitionist says in the human intellect, the formalist says on paper. <laughs> Both he and Hilbert were pretty good at like the polemical stuff. So they made the other side sound completely ridiculous. Um, so, so for formalism, mathematics is an analytic um, process of deduction performed on the sets of axioms which have been treated as logical givens. So Ka Kavya makes a big deal about the difference between an axiomatic approach and what constructivism offers. Sometimes it's not always clear. I, I'm still trying to understand that. But um, So the emphasis on internal consistency of symbolic structure governed by unambiguous rules. Um, so a formalist was provide these axioms, and typically these axioms are understood as sort of eternally true, self-evident, and obvious. Prager definitely thought of axioms that way. But um, so this conditions a very different outlook on creativity to the intuitionistic model I will endorse, Kavya endorses, um, whose extensibility, meaning taking it to new um, places, will re rest instead on the formation of inferential rules, which yield new types. So it sounds maybe like some sort of technical distinction, but it, it does influence how you think about what it is you're doing when you make something new. 
For the formalist, the meaninglessness of the symbols is assured by the lack of the equivalent. They're not really saying anything, they're just symbols. Denoting nothing in themselves, but instead embodying a purely analytic practice. This assumption would be proven untenable in due course, classical logic inheriting a semantics, which Tarski would in time identify as metalingual. So what I just mentioned, Tarski's undefinability uh, theorem shows that, well, actually you can't just use the symbols to decide what um, different things, which things are equivalent to each other. So there's kind of this injection from the outside. And um, truth tables actually are an example of this because we're kind of saying kind of at the outset um, what uh, which things count as true and false. And it seems but like that's unavoidable. That's only, that is an artifact. That is not a uh, universal thing, right? It's only an artifact of formalism. Artifact of formalism. Yeah. So if you didn't, like, I don't know what it would mean to like avoid formalism and have internal truth conditions. Well, no, what I meant was the, the metalinguistic apparatus that was needed. Was right, right, right. What I meant, it's, I think the, it, it would be good to emphasize that what uh, Kavya is trying to sort of like go for is to present that we don't, we can, we can create a system where we don't need this metalinguistic apparatus where like the semantics is like buried in the form, in in the system itself. In the right. Right. So this is super uh, crucial and it'll come back many times. So we, we, like it doesn't necessarily do justice to it in this chapter, but it comes back many times. And if any of you are curious to look into homotopy type theory, there's a there's homotopy type theory book and there's a couple of other resources and just look at the introduction and like initial few pages, you'll get a feeling for this, which is that um, there's a distinction between syntax and semantics. And the syntactic, the purely syntactic approach comes across as like, I just invented a weird game. I don't know why why we pick these rules. I'm just gonna play with these rules. Whereas um, with um, homotopy, homotopy type theory and some of these in other constructive approaches, the rules have meaning. So they are, and like the way that you understand them is often with a combination of reference to logic, to mathematics itself, um, and specifically things like topology. Um, so, so there's there's ways of understanding the rules themselves. So they're not just meaningless any, anymore. That's what I think, Himanshu. That's what you're trying to you're talking about, right? Yeah, so that, I know, but they're 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 extensible. Right. So that's so instead of starting with some commitment to axioms that have sort of universal scope, you can work with your, your system that has both symbols and a semantics, which means that the steps you're taking never feel completely unreasonable. And at the same time, you can get to points where you can supplement your game, if you like, with new meaningful structures. And this is actually what happens in practice. Uh, so it's much more close to what mathematicians actually do. It's like practicing um, geometry, basically. Yeah, or, um, so that's, it's a little hard to see if you don't like look at a lot of proofs, but. But I, I think even from a, from a, an applied math perspective, which is what more, more or less what we do, um, you can see that well, I'm not kind of, it's a little bit like some of you may have seen Feynman's um, lectures, um, the character of physical law. And in one of the lectures, he talks about Babylonian versus Greek mathematics. And this is a cartoon. So he says, Babylonians didn't have proofs. They just sort of pulled out what's useful nearby to the problem at hand that they had already decided was true and then just use that. Whereas the Greeks started with self-evident axioms and worked their way down. And he says, physics needs to be the Babylonian. Okay? We don't start with self-evident axioms as physicists, we just work. Now here is something kind of intermediate between those two, which is we do like mathematicians like kind of treat proof as their bread and butter. They're not going to abandon proof anytime soon, but, um, but they can say that uh, the proofs can actually carry much more content than simply symbol manipulation, like empty symbol manipulation. And that's like the key, like, like I'm glad you brought that up. Because it's kind of the I, key. I really, I, I really do not understand this. I'm sorry. <laughs> like, I, I mean, the, that there's some implication to, uh, to, to symbol manipulation. It's like, okay, fine. Like, but wait, I mean, like, I don't know. Like, well, it's the other way around, right? Like that. So I, I agree that sometimes it seems like the differences are minor in that, why can't I just keep adding axioms just like I do add new types? Right. I, so it's, you, you can, but then you end up with like 
Tarkovsky's model theoretic framework, right? Where you have to add the axioms as extra scaffolding on top rather than into the system itself. Right. right. So, uh, so they don't like in, like it doesn't embed properly in, in some, in some way. That is exactly where we're going. So this, the, the embedding is like actually a key idea here. But so if you look at um, uh, the um, like, like Rob, it doesn't, it doesn't, play, it doesn't like get into like the microstructure in some sense, if that makes sense. Yeah. So if you look at homotopy type theory, so Rob and I both kind of attended some lectures on this recently. Uh, if you look at that, uh, the, the syntax with which you form meaningful statements is closely related to the syntax by which you prove it. And that syntax is quite meaningful. Um, it, like it doesn't, uh, so so it, it, you're bringing the meaningful part of the, co the content of the mathematics and the, the symbolic apparatus closer together. Um, and that's what they are attempting to do. It's not a complete by any means, and it sort of hasn't made full contact with the rest of mathematics. But uh, it's kind of like saying, can, can our proofs be more than just, uh, oops, like some proofs, like, like for instance, one thing that they, I think he brings up here and maybe others do is that, if, if a proof was just like a, a certificate of authenticity, right, a guarantee, okay, good, somebody proved that this is true, then why would people make new proofs? The idea is that each proof kind of gives you a different way of thinking um, about the problem. So a, a, a proof structure system that's well suited to the semantics of the problem you're solving helps you think about the problem. So there you can kind of see the ghost of, of Brow, right? That you're you're trying to actually not just uh, show things that you, like I pinched something from my intuition and now I want to show it to you, but I'm actually kind of working in the opposite direction. I'm training my intuition by reading other people's proofs. So this and is they, like, this is similar to the notion that, that uh, like translation between like languages will like lead, leads to new concepts in and of itself. Well, yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's, that's the, the, cool. you know, like it more topological or a uh, way to think of it, which is like when you're in a new new place, a new city or a new area, right? Um, it's good to know whether you can go from point A to point B, but it's also very useful to know all the different ways you can go from A to B, right? So just knowing that having one path from A to B is not the only interesting thing. A lot more is revealed of the landscape as you traverse multiple paths. Yeah. I mean, I agree. This is definitely like a, a weird thing to, to that is not super, <laughs> ironically, not that intuitive initially. Um, but I think even this glimpses of homotopy kind of give you uh, that. Uh, yeah, I mean, like, I'm, I'm only, I'm only objecting to, to the use of the word meaningful because, like, it's, it's yeah, even I, 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 so I would say how I see it. Like, I would actually I argue it. from, from a neuroscience perspective, it is actually more intuitive. It is from the purely, uh, the formalist slash logician perspective that it is counterintuitive, in the sense that this is exactly how, with Himanshu's example, we do actually navigate the world or count or do any of those operations or our content addressable memory works. All of that is based on exactly this kind of an approach. And it is very intuitive. It is exactly how we will go about doing it. But if you ask us to explain it, we might not be able to explain it, but that's how, yeah. Yeah, I mean, like, I, I, like I, for, for a while, like in my own head anyway, I, I was referring to the, these sorts of things as weak logic. Like because like the things that like people do like are typically like weak in terms of logic. So, so that's like, the thing, right? <laughs> that's what it is, right? So like to me, what what Karthik said and 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 what you said is like it's like um, we know that to some extent these abstract proofs are are a little bit distant from like applied practice, right? And but at the same time, it's like can we do better to actually bring the two a little bit closer together? Uh, and I think something about that is is appealing here. Are, so, are the way, are the, are the example is like in in programming, like why do people come up with yet another way of sorting numbers, right? What, why is just one num one way of sorting not enough? Um, so it's because the way you sort is itself interesting to people, right? Not not just the output of it. So you come up with a. a you know, someone can come with the idea which is cooler than the previous idea, even if it will be slower or less efficient, right? 
people will find it more interesting. And because why? Because there's something something there. There's some. It is not just. It's not meaningless, right? They find some meaning in there, which is why. In fact, can... if if you think about it, like the more aspects of of a proof structure are meaningful, the more they'll influence like how you can extend them elsewhere. Because if they seem very much like this sort of like Jenga tower of, of abstraction, right? You won't necessarily know how to take it out of its context to use somewhere else. But I think that that's the kind of idea here that you're, as many steps as possible are, are, are um, meaningful outside of um, just the rules of the, of the narrow game you're playing with the system. And, and uh, interestingly, you, you've actually hit upon a good thing that uh, Brewer actually followed himself uh, with the fact that his fixed point theorem can actually be applied and generalized to every other domain in uh, mathematics itself. Like there are multiple fixed point theorems depending on what you choose, right? So it's sort of like, it's a general idea that you can now import to some other problem as well. Yeah, so so yeah, so I guess let's, let's see what he said. I, I think I continue this on the next page. Intuitionism by contrast would provide its own semantics rooted in its constructive doctrine originating in um, aimed at the heart of logical foundation. So I, he said, says this at the beginning, I kind of brought it at the end, which is the three founding axioms of Western logic, which all the way back to Aristotle, law of identity, law of non-contradiction, law of excluded middle. So Brouwer says, well, and he was not, he was doing all this before, um, you know, Gödel, Cantor, and, and um, uh, sorry, Gödel and Turing and Church. So he was already kind of thinking, maybe not in terms of contingency, but his choice sequences kind of are in that domain. So, um, so he has a kind of critique uh, of the law of the excluded middle, which, um, so um, the long belief in the principle of the excluded third, which is that either A or not A must be true by stipulation, um, is considered by intuitionism as a phenomenon of history of civilization of the same kind as the old time belief in the rationality of pi. Uh, intuitionism tries to explain the long persistence of this dogma by two facts. First, the obvious non-contradictority of the principle for an arbitrary single assertion. So it's like you can, in, in, for specific cases, you can show that it holds. Second, the practical validity of the whole of classical logic for an extensive group of simple everyday phenomena. So it's like when you depart from the everyday, such as in the case of infinity potentially, maybe you should be wary of using the excluded middle. And also, we haven't talked about it here, but you can use the excluded middle to have like existence proofs that a solution exists, but I don't tell you what it is. Um, so, and this this is, uh, becomes a, a kind of a conceptual issue, and for computer scientists, it becomes a practical issue because there's no point in knowing about something that exists if you can't actually show me what it is. Um, but yeah, everybody else thought of it as so fundamental that Hilbert said it was like asking a boxer to uh, uh, not use his fists. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, so, and, and this I think is is the real kind of uh, uh, message here that he wants to, 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 to hit on, that, um, that rejecting, rejecting the LEM places undecidability at the heart of mathematics, um, insisting that mathematicians drop uh, Platonist notions regarding the discovery of proofs emphasizing instead a dynamic and resourceful, resource sensitive search space of potential proof construction. Search space, which is not simply conditioned by a priori forms, but is instead constrained by those topologies, which mathematical creativity is able to realize as novel structures in the world. So this is a, a lot happening here, uh, and it can definitely come across as sort of nonsense, but I think that there's enough um, in the rest of the book to kind of flesh out what he's getting at this topological way of thinking about um, mathematical creativity. Um, I myself don't have any major problems with Platonism, but but there's something exciting about this, this sort of, and something about bringing the theoretical world closer to the practical when you emphasize construction. Um, so, and for more on that, um, this free choice aspect that Nicholas Gissin video, which I can send again after this, um, is really good actually. Uh, I myself don't fully understand uh, free choice sequences all that well, but um, I'm trying to read up on it. So, so this is kind of the again, kind of where the book will go, in trying to show developments in in type theory and homotopy type theory that connect 
notions of computation with a kind of geometry. Uh, and by geometry specifically means a topology in a space that's not the standard space of topology, but, but there's, um, again, a powerful intuition there, which is that computation involves a kind of navigation in a constructed space. So, um, uh, so that becomes a pretty rich set of ideas that could, could um, I think, uh, maybe influence how we frame higher cognition for neuroscience. That's a complete punt at this moment, meaning I don't know how I would do that. But because it's a tangible sort of metaphor and the topological properties of neural activity are, are like increasingly of interest to people, uh, it, it, it makes higher cognition maybe seem less far away <laughs> from neuroscience than it has seemed so far. Well, yeah, I mean, like the, I think that the, the, I mean, the point or the, the, the real question is to tie any of this stuff to dynamics, to neural dynamics. Right. So there again, um, Brouwer's emphasis on, on time uh, will potentially come in handy. Um, and also this topological kind of conception, which I think, so I think in computer science anyway, you already have a, a good sensitivity to time. Um, and sort of unfolding. Um, so so, so I, I definitely think that's, that's useful. But yeah, that's my summary of chapter one. And I, but I, I'm starting to think of contingency uh, and um, does anyone recognize what this is? There's a clue. It's, it's from the 1981 um, version of uh, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. And so they, the, the plot involves uh, these people, a civilization who constructs a vast computer, and they ask it to give the answer to life, the universe, and everything. And it takes millions of years, and like there's like they don't know how long it's going to take. Uh, and so there's a, they, like civilization just waits, and eventually they have, like okay, an answer is coming, and it spits out forty two. And uh, then we're like, oh shoot, uh, what does it mean? And, and and then the computer says, well, that was the answer, and they're like, what's the question? And they make an even bigger computer to find out what the question to the answer to life, the universe, and everything is. So that I thought was an example of <laughs> contingency. You have to wait and see. But yeah, any other um, comments, thoughts? I can I can stop the recording soon, also, unless someone wants to record something. I'll stop the recording then.